What do I got to do to get called by God? Like, what kind of folk does God call? Moses, when he gets in, he's 80 years old. He's been on the lamb for 40 years, running away in hiding from Egyptian authorities because he murdered somebody in cold blood. And that's who God picks. Today we're going to look at Moses, and Moses is going to get called. You ever hear that term, the calling? Somebody gets their calling, right? So um, you hear it even in secular world where somebody, you know, they say, oh, I'm a great typist. That was my calling, right? Or uh, you're working at waste management, and you say, this is my calling, right? Or I don't know what, you're, you're working at Boeing, and you're tooling stuff. This is my calling. Well, uh, you know, in... Uh, in the Bible, there's a lot of people that get called into ministry. I had a calling into ministry. Uh, many of you had a calling. God called you to be a Christian, right? God, something happened. You went to a Billy Graham crusade, or you were at somebody's house, and you made a decision and said, you know what, I think I like God. I want to love God. I want to know God more. I want to learn more about God. I don't know. Whatever. You know, wherever you're at. And so I was looking at this, and today we're going to see Moses gets called, okay? This is an important deal, because Moses, of all the Bible people, right, you, you got Abraham and Moses, they're kind of your big, your big two, right? They're your big head honcho, serious guys. So you're like, well, if I wanted to get called, what do I got to do to get called by God? Like, what kind of folk does God call, right? So I'll tell you how most people figure that out. Most people figure out what kind of folks God would call by looking at who God called and then looking at him and say, well, people like that, right? So Billy Graham, right? You look at Billy Graham. You know who Billy Graham is, right? Heard of Billy Graham? You say, well, he's old. Well, that's not a characteristic. Uh, he's, uh, he's really holy, right? He like, doesn't have any scandals in his life. So that's probably a good reason. Maybe that's why God called him. Or, or he's really holy, He's really righteous. He knows his Bible really good, and he's a good preacher. So you say, okay, well, this is the kind of person that God calls. People that are holy, people that know their Bible real well, and people that are good preachers. But, you know, if you look at some other pastors in the country, you got like Rick Warren. He started the Purpose Driven Church, right? Um, and he writes books. And you say, okay, well, God called him, so maybe what God is looking for in a person that he'd call is somebody who writes good books and somebody that can plant a lot of churches, but God called me. And you say, well, what's the character? Well, he's really good looking. So maybe that's what God's looking for. God wants to call good looking people, right? I don't know. How come everybody's looking at me like I'm on drugs? I don't know. Here, here's the thing. We're going to look at this guy and that God calls probably the most important guy in the Old Testament. And God calls him, and I want you to remember who they're calling. Here's what we normally do. We read, and we, we look at Moses, and we see from chapter 3 on, and we see that he parts the Red Sea, you know, if you watched the movie, he's got his thing, and he moves it out, and the sea parts, and everybody walks through, you know, and they cruise through the water. And they see all the holy things he does in that. But that's not who God called. That's who he became after he was called. Okay? Like, I am not the person right now that God called. When God called me, I was a horny 14-year-old, okay? And when God called me to ministry, I wasn't even a hornier 19-year-old, okay? I was, that's who God called. In this book right here, Moses, here's who God called. Moses is 80 years old when he gets called. And he has been wandering around in the desert with sheep for 40 years. When he ran away from Egypt, he was 40. Now he gets called, he's 80. 40 years of wandering around the desert. And you know why he's in the desert? Because he's on the lam for committing murder. He murdered an Egyptian. So this is who God calls. Some of you are like, well, I could never be... I could never be a pastor. I could never be a minister. God could never use me because I've got stuff in my past. I've done things that are bad in the past. Well, you could probably never run for president, right, because they'd bring that up. But God can use you because God 
Moses, when he gets him, he's 80 years old. He's been on the lam for 40 years, running away in hiding from Egyptian authorities because he murdered somebody in cold blood. And that's who God picks. Of everybody he could pick in the entire world, he picks a 40-year-old murderer on the lamb. That's who he picks. You're like, really? Why would he pick him? This is the question that I ask, and we all ask. Why would God pick this evil guy? Why wouldn't he pick a good guy? Why wouldn't he pick a holy guy? Why wouldn't he pick a righteous guy? I will tell you why right now. Because that guy doesn't exist. He doesn't exist. He has to pick crooked people because straight people don't exist. They don't. God always makes straight pieces of wood out of crooked sticks. That's how he always does it because there's no straight sticks. There are no good people. The Bible is full of bad people. Okay? It's full of bad people. This room is full of people that are sinful, including the pastor. There aren't any good ones. Okay? It doesn't exist. God reaches down and he looks at the whole world and he says, here is a world full of people. Who am I going to pick? I've got two choices. Sinful people or sinful people. I think I'll pick one of the sinful ones. And he reaches down, not because we're good, not because we deserve anything. He says, I pick you. Why? Because I can. Because I'm nice. God is loving. He says, I'm going to pick you for no other reason but because I want to pick somebody. And why not you? I can do, I can do marvelous things. I can deliver the people of Egypt with anything. I can deliver the people of Egypt without you at all. But boy, it would be great to do it with you. And even though you're a murderer on the land for 40 years, I'm picking you. And so that's what he does. He picks this guy Moses. And we start here in the book of Exodus chapter 3. So go ahead and turn to it. If you don't have a Bible, I just wrote it on the back there so you could just follow along. Actually, I think I'll just use it too myself. So it says right here, follow along. It says, one day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. So his father-in-law is a priest. That's just a little intimidating anyway, right? When your father-in-law is a priest, you're like, I don't know, kind of a little extra something there. He led the flocks far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. This will get your attention. Now, let me explain something to you. Whenever you see angel of the Lord, you want to look for the word before angel of the Lord. If the word before is a, an angel of the Lord or a angel of the Lord, that's an angel. If it says the angel of the Lord, that's Jesus. Okay? So here... Jesus is the one who calls Moses. This is interesting because later they're going to be on a mountain and Jesus is going to be transfigured and Moses is going to be there and they're going to chat some more. Uh, they have an ongoing relationship that started right here. This is where they got acquainted. And so it says here, there the, the angel of the Lord appeared to him a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Okay, God is not appearing in a bush. God is appearing in a fire. God oftentimes represents himself with fire. He presents himself as a fire. We see in the book of Acts that he comes down in the form of the Holy Spirit as fire, right? But he doesn't consume them. That's the cool thing about God is he doesn't consume us. He refines us. This is what's going to happen. This is not by accident that God appears to Moses in this way. Because what God is going to do is he is going to come down as a fire upon the people of Israel and he is going to refine them. Over the next 40 years, he is going to be refining these people. Fire refined. But it doesn't consume them. It doesn't kill them. It just 
changes them. It purifies them. That's what he's going to do with these people of Israel. And this is what's happening. He's representing it right here in the way he presents himself to Moses. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. That's, I was looking at that. That's not the word I would have said. If I saw a bush on fire and it wasn't being consumed, I'd go, holy crap, right? That's what I would say, but I'm not as holy as Moses. He says, this is amazing, okay? That's what he said. I would say, holy crap, that's amazing, and then I would run over. Why isn't the bush burning up? I must go see it. <laughs> that's the, t I think this might, he might have said more what I said. I'm just thinking. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called him from the middle of the bush. Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Because they all understood at this time that if you actually looked at God, it would kill you. You would die. And so, why is the land holy? Why is it holy ground? What, what is it about that area, you think, that makes it holy ground? Can you think of any reason why it would be holy? He says, this is holy ground. Right? Why is it so holy? What's so holy about it? It's sand. What's so holy? Anybody got an idea? Yeah. What do you think? That's exactly it. It's holy because it's God is there. I mean, when God is in this place, this is holy land. When God is in you, you are holy property. Wherever God is, that's holy. And so he says, hey, man, take your shoes off because you're in holy place here. When Moses heard this, he covered his face. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. The land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people out of Egypt. If you turn to the front, you'll see I got some notes here. You should have some pins. You could take a look at that. What, is, what all I care about is God. What I care about in this is what can we know about God? What does this tell me about God? I mean, I don't care much about Moses because Moses isn't really doing anything. He's just the guy that's involved right? But what do I know about God? First thing I know about God, if you look here, is that God in the burning bush is holy. You can write that down if you want on there. God in the burning bush is holy. How do I know this? He says that this land is, is a holy ground. Why? Because God is there. He's a holy God, okay? That's the first thing I find out. The second thing I found out, when he talks here, he talks about why he is coming to deliver them. It's because the God of the burning bush is compassionate, He's compassionate. He has, he has seen that his people are suffering. We spend all kinds of time at the beginning of our service praying for stuff. Why? Because our God is compassionate. We should pray for those things. God doesn't like it when, we, when we're suffering and, and we're hurting and, and we're in pain and we're stressed and all that. God is compassionate. You've met people that aren't compassionate. They just roll right by you. They don't care what's going on. That's not God. God cares. When we weep, God weeps. When we cry, God cries. My little buddy in there, he's going through his scared phase. Okay, so a couple nights ago, it's the middle of the night, it's 3.30 in the morning, he goes, Daddy, Daddy, I'm scared, I'm scared. Well, I can hear him from the other side of the house. Daddy, 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 ah, and he's crying, I'm scared. Well, you know what? I was scared too. I went in there. We've got this little camera that's up on the wall, you know, it's got, and it's got the little lights on it so that you can see in the dark. It's kind of like a night vision. And we can see him all the time from our room. We got the little it's wireless and it's high tech now with the baby, you know. So we're looking at him, and, but it kind of gives a blue tint on the whole room. And I'm in his room and I'm rubbing his back. I go, buddy, nothing's going to happen. I'm not going to let anything happen to you. It's okay. Don't be afraid. And I'm looking around his room and it about freaks me out. 
Remember Moose A. Moose at his first birthday? There was this moose that's his character. It's on the wall, and he's got these big eyes. It looks like the devil on his wall. And I, was, I, was, and I go, oh, Mommy, Mommy, I scared. I scared. I was scared to death, you know? Because I was like, Oh my goodness. God's compassionate, man. When we're afraid, when we're scared, when we're, when we're hurting, when we're crying, God loves us. When we're oppressed, like these people who are in slavery, when we're battling against sin, when we've been defeated for the 12th or 13th or 14th or 100th time, God's compassionate. And he doesn't come and say, you know what, I've had enough of you. It's like, no, I love you. Let me walk through this with you. He's compassionate. Number three, God of the burning bush is eminent. Eminent means he's close by. He's right there. He's involved, right? He's involved. He, he, he's hands-on. God's hands-on. He says, he says right here, he says, I have come down. I have come down to be with you, to help you, to deliver you. I am going to be actively involved in your deliverance. I didn't just send an angel and say, hey, go take care of that. No, 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 no. You guys are important enough that I will do this myself. I will take, I'm not delegating this. I am going to handle this myself. I am going to be with you, Moses, through the process. It says God of the burning bush commissions people to participate with him. That's the other thing that's great about God. God does all these great things, but he lets us be involved. God does not need Moses to deliver the people from Egypt, right? He can blink and they're delivered. He can say, he can come talk to Pharaoh on his own if he likes, and it wouldn't have taken 10 plagues, right? If you're standing face to face with God and you're Pharaoh, and God gets in your face and says, I think you should let my people go, you just let the people go, right? Rather than go through the 10 plagues with Moses, you know, the ex murderer. But God likes to involve us, He likes us to be a part. Being called to ministry is just a privilege, because I know God don't need me. But he lets me be involved. He lets you be involved. Because God's just like that. God's cool. He loves his people. We're involved in ministry not because we're helping God out. Moses isn't helping God out. Moses is involved because God's nice. God's compassionate. God's loving. And he wants to let us be involved. That's why. Okay? God doesn't need me at this church. He doesn't need us. But he lets us be involved. He lets us participate all together. That's what's, man, God's sweet. I love God. He's all right. But Moses protested to God. Of course he did. Why? Because he's Moses. He pro you do the same thing. You know you do. God says, oh, you should do this. I'm calling you. And you go, ah, I got a problem with that. Oh, God, that's not going to work. I'm way smarter than you, God. But Moses protested to God. Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? At least he's asking some legit questions. I, I'm, I'm a murderer on the lamb. I'm not real thrilled about going back to Egypt. They're just going to throw me in the slammer. I don't want to go back. But instead of saying that, he goes, who am I? I'm so unworthy. You know what he's really thinking? Dude, there's no way I'm going back there. Right? I'm not going. I ain't, I ain't doing time. God answered, I will be with you, and this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at, the very, at this very mountain. All right, this to me is really, really rich, okay? He said, first of all, there's a couple things that happen here. There are two questions that Moses asks. I think they're important questions we have to ask. He first he asks, who am I and who are you? Those are the two questions he really asks, isn't it? He says, God, who am I and who are you? Because that makes all the difference. I don't know who I am. I don't know who I am. You got to tell me who I am. Who are you? When God calls you, one of the very first questions you got to ask yourself is, who am I? Who am I? I still struggle with who I am. A lot of my Christian faith is discovering who I am. God, what am I? Who am I? What authority do I have? What authority do I not have? You got to remember, 
Moses tried to deliver a Hebrew once, and it went horribly bad because he was not called at the time. That's why he killed an Egyptian. He was very presumptive about being, I am going to be God's deliverer, and I'm going to deliver the people of Egypt. He goes out and he kills somebody. He's on the land for 40 years because he hadn't been called yet. Right? So it all went south, and now it's like, hey, God, I don't even know who I am. Am I a deliverer? Am I not a deliverer? Am I, am I a shepherd? Am I a husband? Am I, what, what? I don't know who I am. Tell me who I am. And who are you? What God are you? I mean, I've seen, there's gods all over the place, right? There's Egyptian gods, and there's, there's those gods over there. The Hevites got gods. The Perizzites got gods. Uh, the... The Pepsiites got gods. Everybody's got a god. Everybody, what god are you? And he's really clear. God's very clear. I am the god of your forefathers, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, I'm not some new god that's just showed up. I am the god of your forefathers. I am the god that your family has always worshipped. Okay? I, this is, I didn't just come in at the last minute in the fourth quarter. I've always been, this has always been the plan. And what's happening here is actually something that I said would happen and told your father Abraham would happen. He says, I will be with you, and this is the sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very moment. Thanks for that sign, but that's going to be a little bit late in the calling. Do you see what the sign is? The sign that I am with you is that when everything is over and you've delivered all the people, you'll worship outside. You're like, really? That's the sign? Couldn't you give me like a magic trick now? Like, uh, how about like you make a pillar of fire or something right now? The sign that I am, God does that sometimes. He gives us multiple. Now he's going to give them a sign right away. He's going to give them a sign with his staff that turns into a snake. He's going to give him, uh, uh, he'll put his hand in, it'll come out, it'll be leprous, and he'll put it back in, it'll come out, it won't be leprous. But God does that sometimes. Sometimes the signs that God gives us are as a result of our faith, and sometimes the sign gives us, that God gives us is to give us faith. And God gives Moses both. He gives him signs that are supposed to give him some faith and say, yeah, God is with me. I put my hand in, I pulled out, and I got leprosy. Put it back in, pulled out, oh, it all healed. Takes his stick, throws it on the ground. Big snake. Oh, crap. Pulls it. Oh, good. It's a snake again. Okay? That's the sign initially that he's got. But Moses protests. If I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me what is his name. Then what should I tell them? This to me sounds actually more like the classic, I've got a friend who has a problem. That's what it sounds like to me. He wants to know what the name is, but he's like, you know, I was thinking, God, uh, if I go there, these other people might want to know what your name is. So who am, I, who am I supposed to say this is? You know, inquiring minds want to know, and my friends might be curious. I really don't care, but they will, they will want to know what the answer is. What should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. This is one of the most important names you'll ever hear in the Bible because it's referred to all over in the New Testament in the book of John. Actually, one of my favorite passages in the book of John is when all the army comes and they're going to arrest Jesus. There's like a hundred soldiers. They're going to arrest him. And they say, and Jesus says, who are you looking for? And they go, we're looking for Jesus. And he says, I am. I am. He uses the name of God. And all the soldiers, a hundred soldiers, fall down back on the ground. The power of God just, it's incredible. And then there's, there's other times where, uh, there's another time where Jesus is being questioned by the Pharisees. And, uh, and they say, are you more important, are you more powerful than Abraham, our father? And he says, before Abraham was, I am. And he uses the name of God. Says, I am, but God also said to Moses, say this to the people, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. Look at the front. I'm going to give you three things of what the name I am means and why that's important. The first thing is the I am is the God who exists. He exists. That is a great... Uh, 
That's kind of a great characteristic, existence, right? Because you kind of want your God to exist, right? A lot of people worship gods that don't exist. In the Old Testament, we read all kinds of folks that they carve little things and then they, oh, I'm going to worship that statue that I just made. Well, that's not a real God. It's like, a, it's like it used to be wood 20 minutes ago and now you're worshiping it. I want a God that's got some power that can do some stuff. One of my favorite uh, philosophers is Descartes. You ever heard of Descartes? You've heard of him and he said, he said uh, I think therefore I am. This is how that all worked out. He would say... Uh, I want to know for sure. What can I know for sure? He says, well, my eyes have deceived me in the past. I've looked at stuff and I said, oh, I thought it was something, but it's something else. So my eyes have deceived me, so I can't really trust my eyes. And my ears, you know, there are sometimes I thought I heard something, but it was something else. It's like I heard something, I thought it was a bird, but it was really like a rhinoceros. And I'm like, okay, well, that, I, I can't trust my ears. So I can't trust that. And he went through all of his senses. Can't trust my nose. I can't trust my taste. Can't trust my sense of feeling. So he says, well, what can I know for certain? And he said, well, there is somebody that is thinking all this stuff through. That's thinking that I can't smell. And thinking that I can't trust my sight. And thinking I can't trust my mouth. I think, therefore, I must exist. I must exist. I am. I think, therefore, I am. And one of the great characteristics of God that is represented in the I am statement, his name, I am, is he's saying, I am means I exist. When you call on I am, you call on a God that can actually do something because he exists. Not only that, but I am is a God who is independent. He's independent. I am. It's not I, it's not we are. It is I am. Am. I am independent of everybody else. I don't need you. I'll participate with you. I'll get you involved. But I am means I am independent. God is independent. He doesn't need us. And finally, I am is the God who is unchanging. He's unchanging. You can write that down. What does it mean, unchanging? I am. It means that I am right now. What I am now is the same as I was a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, three thousand years ago, three thousand years ago, I am. I am what I am now. It's not I was. It's not I will be. I am always I am. And I never change from what I am. That's what God means when he makes this, makes this word here. And so the big question is, Why does God call Moses? That's the question I keep asking. Why call him? Of all the people you could possibly call, why call Moses? A guy who's been in the desert 40 years, wandering around on the lamb, escaping conviction and prosecution for murdering somebody in cold blood. Why would God pick that person? Because he can. Same reason he calls everybody. Because he can. God loves... Picking the underdog. God loves picking the, the kid that had all kinds of struggles when he was little. God loves calling the people who know beyond a shadow of a doubt they can't do it on their own. God loves that because it sa God says in Scripture, he says, he says uh, my power is made perfect in weakness. He's talking to Paul when he says that. But I love that statement because when we think we're strong, we try to do it all. The best ministers of God are people that don't think they can do it. That know they can't do it. That are asking God all kinds of questions. When God calls them, their hands up over and over. Uh, God, well, what about this? What about that? God, I can't do that. Oh, God, I, uh, oh, God, uh, you got to pick somebody else, man. I'll never be able to do it. Oh, God, God, look at me. I'm fat and rolling around and I'm middle-aged and, and I ain't got no hair. Why, why would you pick me? Don't you, Pick him. He's got hair. He's smarter than me. That person over there is better than me. That person over there knows their Bible better. That person's a better speaker. That person's better looking. That person, everything. What, God, why are you picking me? Because I can. Because maybe when I pick you, everybody will know, man, that guy could never do it on his own. That guy needs God. That's what they said about me. That guy needs God. Hopefully that's what they say about you. That guy needs God. 
God is so good, and, uh, and I love him so much. And, and I hope that you're encouraged today that God will do great things with really weak people. That there's no such thing as a straight stick. At least God doesn't call straight sticks. They don't exist. Everything, he always gotta, he's always got to look for jagged things because that's all there is. And he takes these jagged and messed up and twisted whatever and turns it into something great and uses that straight stick to build something wonderful, whether that's delivering people, whether it's helping people, whether it's loving people who don't feel loved, whether it's leading people to Jesus, whether it's cooking for people, whatever. But God calls all of us. We've all been called. Remember in the book of Acts when the fire came down? It was tongues of fire came down. It didn't come down just on Peter. The tongues of fire came down on every single head of every single person in that congregation. Every single person. The good looking, the bad looking, the smart, the not so smart, the holy, the not so holy, the young, the old. It came on everybody because God calls us all to be ministers. It's called the priesthood of all believers. God calls us all to be ministers. And so you've received a calling from God. And not because of anything you did. Just because God's nice and wants to let you play along. All right? Let's pray. God, thank you for letting us be here today. And uh, God, thank you for calling us. Thanks for letting us participate with you in the great plans you've got for us, whatever they are. And God, we pray that you'd continue to guide us and lead us and uh, uh, make us more like you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.